This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. To remind you of most of the rules for a standard net present value, one quick example. But the most likely sort of question is what I always call a short project. A short project for the exam, he never plays games, but is almost always four or five years. So as not to spend too long, I've kept this one even shorter. Uh, but the most likely is you get a project lasting four or five years. And if he wants the net present value, which he almost certainly will, the main bit of the exercise is sorting out the cash flows each year. Working out each year what is the net cash. And then I'll remind you when we come to it, then we discount. But if you get one of these, the first thing you must do before you start messing around with the figures, wasting time reading, always sort out as fast as you can how long does the project last. We'll read when we need in a minute, but can you all look at this question I've given you? How long does this project last? Yeah, yeah. It's never that hard. I've kept this short. I was saying the exam, you're likely, quite likely to get more wording, which obviously takes time. Uh, but it says somewhere, third line down, uh, we're going to buy a machine. It costs this much. It lasts three years. As soon as you've found out the life of the project, I say it's normally four or five years, but immediately set up your columns. You can set this out any way you like. But the examiner always does his cash flows in columns, so make it easier for the marker. Set up columns. Uh, zero is now. One year. Time one is one year from now. Two years from now. Three years from now. And remember, or I'll remind you why later, if ever there's tax in the question, which there probably will be, leave space because not always, but you'll probably need a fourth year. All right? I'll remind you why in a minute. Um, once you've sorted out how long and set up your columns, the idea is to get the net cash, or the cash receipts, the cash payments each year. Always, always, again, I'll remind you why later, be patient with me, but always go for what we call the operating cash flows. The word itself doesn't matter, you need to put headings, but the operating cash flows, they're the cash you're getting effectively from your profits, your income statement. You're after the income statement items, your sales, your expenses. But remember, we're after the cash flows. Any non-cash items are irrelevant, all right? And so often, I don't think I've bothered here, but so often he mentions things like depreciation. Depreciation would simply be there to test you knew it was irrelevant. It's only cash flows you're after. You with me? If there was depreciation mentioned, there'd be a mark for ignoring it. However, ignore anything else. Look for your operating flows at the moment. Your sales, your expenses. If you look down, it says uh, we're going to produce 50,000 units a year. I've given you a cost card for the first year. Uh, and it says the selling price. Have we all found it? It's $30 a unit. Mm -hmm. And so our sales revenue, two, three things here. Uh, first of all, I haven't said, but there's no mention of any inventories, so presumably we're selling 50,000 a year in the first year. And show bits of workings, as I said before to Zana, don't show pages of it. If there's lots of workings, keep it on a separate page. Little workings, as long as you need. Actually, show on the, the statement, if you're with me. Uh, but what is the revenue in the first year? Uh, we're selling 50,000 units. The selling price in the first year is $30. And so at $30, I always got mixed up on my zeros. Is it one and a half million? Hello? Uh, in the exam, for heaven's sake, unless he says different, 
do things to the nearest thousand. Don't have millions of zeros floating around, it's pathetic. If I keep it all to the nearest thousand, 50,000 units at $30. But I think it's 1,500. Am I right? No problem. Here, though, if you, if you look further down, although we are going to sell 50,000 a year, it says below the cost card, revenue and materials increase at the rate of 5% per annum. And so, no big problem, but remember, we want to get the actual cash flows each year. And so, surely, if it's increasing at 5%, in the second year, sorry, in the second year, it'll be 1,500 plus 5%. Or oh, you should all be happy to add on 5%, simply multiply by 1.05. And therefore, you'll expect cash in the second year at 1,500 times 1.05. Is it 1,575? And again, don't show masses of workings. Uh, you'll add up, carry on here, adding on 5% each year, multiplying by another 1.05, I think gives me, to the nearest thousand, 1,654 in the third year. Clear? Is everybody with me? You know, I don't want to take too long, so I haven't given you much time to read. If you've lost a figure, please share it. All right? But that's straightforward. Uh, one other thing there, I keep saying, and it doesn't really matter here, but I kept saying, oh, it could be 1500 in the first year, 1575 in the second year, and so on. Do remember, it's no big deal, but it... There's one place later it could affect us. That one is not the first year. That is not the year ended, 2009 or something. That is one year from now. Time zero is now. 18th of May or whatever it is. Time one is one year from now. You know, 17th, 18th of May next year and so on. However, remember, for all operating flows, we always assume the cash flow is at the end of the year. So, and it can be important, it can be important for the written. If today is 1st of January, so I start business now, time zero is 1st of January, I'll start earning money immediately, presumably. I'll be earning 1500 throughout the next 12 months. We assume we get the cash at the end of the year, 31st December, which is one year away. All right? It's a small point, but later it just could be critical. However, normally, as I've said, it's four or five years. takes a bit longer here, three. Easy enough. Oh, we're okay about the sales revenue. Uh, in a similar way, go through the costs. Here, what costs have we got straight from the cost card? Uh, first of all, materials. I'm not going to keep showing workings, mine will get messy, but check me. Uh, it says in the first year, materials are $8, 50,000 units at $8. Is it 400,000? An outflow of payment. Again, there's going to be inflation. The inflation on materials, look below again, is 5%. And so keep multiplying by a factor, 1.05. So, no, revenue and materials. Yeah. Sorry, we'll inflate at 5%. So add on 5% each year, 400 times 1.05 is 420. And check me, because I'm not showing every bit of workings. Multiply by another 1.05, and I think that time 3 is 441. Happy, everybody? And, of course, this bit of it really is just speed and efficiency with your calculator. And so what else is there? Uh, there's labour. $6 a unit in the first year. 50,000 units, so I think 300. 
Labour, though, is inflating at 10% a year, multiplied by 1.1 each year, and I think it comes to 330 Uh, and at time 3363. And finally, for this bit of it, variable overheads. Uh, $4, 50,000 units, it's 200 in the first year. Um, again, all other costs are at 10, so this is inflating at 10%. And so. At time two is two twenty. At time three, I think is two four two. All right. Hello. Is everybody clear? All right. One extra thing to watch for before we carry on, and be very careful. He's done both things here. Here, I specifically said in the question that that cost card was for the first year. So in the first year. Materials are eight dollars, labor is six dollars, and so on. And in future, they'll inflate. So, you all said you were happy, the adding on ten percent, five percent. We're all clear, everybody. Now, ah, read very carefully because he does one of two things he either does this and says, Here are the amounts in the first year. Or, and don't change yours here, but what I could have said is that materials, for example, I could have said they're $8 per unit at current prices. Now, not here, so don't change your figures. But if ever he says a cash flow is at current prices, and, of course, it's inflating. Was it 10 per 5%? Yeah? It's exactly the same question, but I said those costs were at current prices. Be careful, it's not hard. But the first expense will be at time one. But if it's at current prices, it means if you are buying them today, it will be $8. You know, we haven't even bought the machine yet. <laughs> But we've got quotes, materials will be eight dollars a unit. But of course, the first purchase will be next year. And by next year it will have gone up. Had it been at current prices, then the receipt at time one will automatically inflate. It's fifty thousand units. At the moment it's eight dollars. But by time one, it would be five percent higher. And so the actual cash flow at time one, on that wording, wouldn't be 400. It would be 420. And then the year after, 5% higher, and so on. Now, is everybody with me there? Yeah. Be very careful, because again, well, if you've not understood me, asking, but otherwise, it's when you're rushing in the exam. It's so easy in a hurry to misread. It won't fail you because, again, we'll mark every line separately. But it's an awful pity to lose the mark simply because of misreading. If it gives you first year, that is cash flow, then it inflates. If it's current prices, it automatically inflates. Okay? Now, finally, for the moment, before I carry on with the others... A lot of people want to take shortcuts. Uh, it's entirely up to you, but labour and variable overheads, for instance, are inflating at the same rate. If you want, then you can just put 500, you know, put the total, and then just inflate the total. You all clear what I mean? It's up to you. I never do. And the reason is, I've kept this short, but the danger is, if you've misread one bit of it, you know, perhaps I, I understood labour right and misread variable. The trouble is, if you put the two together, you risk losing both marks. I would rather spend a few seconds longer 
being I'm always scared of this red, I'll still get marks for the ones I've left properly. All right? That's up to you. Anyway, back to the question. Any more operating flows? Uh, below that cost card, it says fixed overheads of the company currently amount to 600,000. The management accountant has decided 20% of these should be absorbed or charged to the new product. Irrelevant. Why? It's very standard indeed, but why here? And the fixed overheads irrelevant. Yeah, do remember what we're after is the cash flow effects on the company. All we want to know if we do this machine, what extra cash flows will there be? Well, for profit purposes, you can charge fixed overheads any way you like, but we're not doing profits. All we care about is do fixed overheads change or not. If fixed overheads go up for any reason, then the extra cost is relevant. Simply charging them between different products does not mean that we've got extra costs. All right, Elsa? And be careful, he does both. So often he throws something like this in. He says we're going to charge 20% to this machine. But again, that doesn't mean there's any extra cost and therefore irrelevant. Okay. Other times he might tell you fixed overheads go up by 10,000. Well, if they did go up, then you'd stick it in. Clear? Uh, there'll be a mark for ignoring it. And in fact, to be safe, if I were you, without writing long essays, anything you ignore You'll ignore depreciation. Here, you'll ignore the fixed costs. Yeah? Because there will be marks. I would actually write down why you've ignored it. And then he knows you've ignored it for the right reason. It wasn't just that you hadn't noticed it or you didn't know what to do. All right. Uh, however, uh, we'll ignore fixed costs for that reason. There's no other operating flows. At that stage, do a total. So the net cash operating flow at uh, time one is 600, at time two, 605, at time three. Uh, I think 608. The next thing to deal with or to check, uh, check if there's tax involved, and almost certainly in the exam there will be. And if you look at the end of the question, it says, the second line from the end, there is tax at 25%. So he'll always give you the tax rate, obviously. It's payable one year in arrears. And I think most of us have done, or not quite all of us have done F6, but uh, for anybody who hasn't done F6, capital allowances is tax allowable depreciation. All right? Now, again, uh, I know you weren't all here, but there are two ways you can deal with tax both of which give the same final answer. But we need to bring tax in because clearly tax is a cash flow. The more we receive, the more tax we'll pay. All right? Well, as I say, there are two ways of dealing with it. By far the safest, the easiest, the quickest is the way I did before and the way I do it and the way the examiner usually does it. Sometimes you does it one way, sometimes another, but usually this way. Once you've got your operating flows, work out the tax on the operating flows at whatever rate you're given here at 
Uh, whether you remember how we deal with capital ounces or not, for the moment, ignore them. If there was no tax allowable depreciation, you'd pay tax on 600, 605, etc. Agreed? And so this is a desperately easy mark. Uh, it, there's never any tricks. 25% of 600 is 150. Check the timing of it. He will either tell you tax is payable immediately, in which case there'll be 150 payable at time one, or as here, he'll tell you there's a one year delay, one year in arrears. And so, clear for everybody 25% of 600 is 150, it would be payable one year later at time two. Again, you're all with me? He does? And so on, it's easy arithmetic, so check me to the nearest thousand, remember. 605, 25% is 151. 608, 25% is 152. Uh, but of course, you need an extra year. The tax on year three's income would be payable at time four. All right. Everybody happy there? As I say, I'm not going to say this again. You can deal with tax a different way, but this is by far the best. Because that now is a joke, Mark. Even if you got those figures wrong for any reason, you'd still get this mark for doing 25% of your operating cash flow. All right? Everybody, what's that? Look happy then. <laughs> All right, uh, the next thing to look for always is any capital flows. And by capital flows, all I ever mean is the cost and any sale value, any scrap value. And I don't think these have ever been a trick, apart from it taking a few minutes sometimes to find them. Here it should be obvious. Second line, the machine costs 1.2 million. So it's 1,200 immediately, time zero. And then the scrap or the sales proceeds. Third line of the question, uh, it says there's 400. Presumably receivable at the end of the project in three years time. So as I keep saying, apart from the time reading, when there's more words there, uh, again, an easy mark. All right, Marika? More ahead. However, now comes the other bit of the tax, that thanks to the capital expenditure, there will have been tax allowable depreciation, and you might use that word, or capital allowances. And so, of course, the true tax bill will be lower, you'd actually be paying tax on 600 less. You with me? A couple of hours. Well, keep them separate. We've worked out the tax if there was no capital allowances. Separately, show the tax saving we'll make on capital allowances. And so whatever the capital allowances are each year, it would have reduced taxable profit, therefore will save tax at whatever rate, 25%. This is the one place where you certainly stand to need workings. And so let's check. Capital allowance workings. He'll always give you the rules. It's not a tax exam. And so check carefully. Here, though, and usually, it says at the bottom, capital allowances, it's 25% reducing balance. And so all of you should know what that means, whether you've done F6 or not. The original cost was 1200 At 25% reducing balance, the first computation, 
25% of cost is what, 300? Giving you a written down value of 900. And in a minute, of course, we carry on taking 25%. You're all happy about reducing balance? No problem. However, before you rush through, before you get all excited, you know, we love strange facts that this is balance, you know. Ten years later, they're still doing it. Uh, once you've done the first computation, always pause for a second and check three things. The first is a silly point, but a lot of people miss it. Remember, 300 is your first allowance. Taxable profits will go down 300, and therefore the tax you'll save is the tax on 300. So what I mean is the actual tax saving you'll make, the tax rate here, I've walked away, was it 25%? Mm -hmm. And so though the allowance is 300, the saving will be 25% of 300. 75. You're all clear? I stress it because I've seen it so many times when you're rushing, it's such a common error. They stick 300 in. Well, of course, the actual tax you save that we want is only 75. True? Mm -hmm. Secondly, decide when you're going to get that saving. Now, I'll remind you of the rule later, although in the exam, he tends not to bother about it. He's not really fussed. Anybody in this particular question, when will you save that 75? Will it be now times zero? Will it be time one? Will it be time two? And so on. When are you going to save that 75? One, two, any threes or zeros? All right, I'll give you the rule. But I say again, in the exam, um, these days, he tends to allow anything sensible. But the rule is this. If you buy a machine, or whatever it is, on the first day of an accounting period, now I'm sorry, I'm only going to write this as a rule. Last time I went through dates convincing everybody, if anybody's not happy about the rules, speak to me separately. But if you buy on the first day of an accounting period, They'll actually calculate the allowances at the end of the accounting period, which is a year later, plus or minus a day. And then with a the one year lag in tax, you'll actually pay any tax a year later. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you buy the machine on the first day of an accounting period, then the first capital allowance saving will be at time two. It's a year before they calculate it, and then a year before actual tax payments. On the other hand, if you buy the machine on the last day of an accounting period, So if my year ends December, and if you actually bought a machine on the 31st December, and certainly the way UK tax works, even though it was bought on the very last day, you get the full allowance. But if you buy it on the last day, it calculate the allowance immediately. Tax is payable one year later. The delay will only be one year. The first capital allowance saving is at time one. Now, I know some of, the, some of you who weren't here might be a bit confused by that. If it worries you, you can ask me after. 
However, although they used to mess around with that in the past, these days the question almost certainly won't tell you when you bought it. If you're not told, this is for the exam, if not told, so like my example just says if we buy a machine, it say when we buy it, then what to do in the exam is this. The first capital allowance saving is same, I think you'll see what I mean, I'm not going to write pretty, pretty English. The first capital allowance saving is the same year as the first tax payment. Now, because I don't want to waste time writing a great long pretty, pretty sentence, you clear what I mean here. Here, I didn't tell you when we bought the machine. I say that's normally the case in the exam. And so simply say, when was the first tax payable on your profits? The first tax payable was 150 and it was at time two. Well, assume your first capital allowance saving is on at the same time period. Do you all understand what I mean there? And although I said, I had to write down the rule, although I said if it were as anybody asked me, the chance of needing that rule these days is tiny. Simply sort out the tax on profits, bring in capital allowance saving on the same day, and almost, you're almost guaranteed to get it right. Okay? Now, finally, though, before we go back to our tax computation, it sounds silly, but always check before you carry on. How many years will we be calculating allowances for? Three. However long the machine lasts. Uh, the machine lasts three years, so we'll have allowances for three years. But watch the remaining bit, and remember the last bit of rule. It's reducing balance, so your second computation, 25% of 900 is 225. Is that correct, please? And therefore the tax saving, 25% of the allowance Uh, if I get to the nearest thousand, is it 56? Is my arithmetic right? Mm -hmm. And of course, you don't need to think about timing anymore. The first one was time two, the next one's a year later, and so on. Well, the last bit to remember, you carry on 25% each year until the final year. And of course, our final year is the third... Agreed? And here's the one, what you might call a little bit of pure tax rules, but learn it. In the final year, you don't get 25%. In the final year, you simply deduct the sale proceeds. How much did we sell it for here? 400. And whatever's left is effectively your capital allowance. That here, if we deduct 400, we're left with 275. The name doesn't matter, but those of you who've done F6 would know it's called the balancing allowance. The allowance will be 275, and so the saving at 25% is how much? Um, is it 69 to the nearest? Thingy? And so it's not hard, but make sure you've got it because the capital allowance bit 
you know, every item gets a mark. This would certainly get two or two and a half marks. Obviously, it's a bit longer. But always the final year. And again, I shouldn't need save. Uh, but if the scrap proceeds were zero, then the allowance would be, you know, 675 minus zero would be 675. Equally, uh, if the scrap proceeds were what? 800. Then, of course, instead of getting an allowance, it would be a charge. 675 minus 800 is, I think, 125. But instead of saving tax, you would pay tax. All right? So, no problem. All right, let's go back quickly and finish it off. Um, if we go back to the table, 75, 56, and 69... And so you tax in two bits, the tax payable on the profit separately, the amount of saving big allowances. Okay? Finally, look for any non tax items. And the only one you're likely to see, and the one that almost always is there, is working capital. If you look at this question, it says in the, almost the last line, an additional 100,000 of working capital is needed at the start of the project. Uh, remember, although it's not your problem, the working capital is there to finance extra inventories, extra receivables. But if you need to spend 100, there's a cash outflow at time zero. Sorry, are we all right? Do you want me to wind back to the allowances? Oh, well, grab me after. Uh, no, work, working capital. Uh, there's an alpha times zero of 100. Remember, unless you're told different, you automatically assume that we need extra inventory, etc., for the life of the project. But at the end of the project, it's released. You get the 100 back. It's a desperately easy mark, but you'll get it back at the end unless, obviously, you're told different. Okay? As a result, the net cash flow each year Uh, simply add up, it's an outflow of 1,300 at time zero, an inflow of 600 at time one, at time two, five thirty at time three, is it 1013, mm -hmm. and at time uh, four, is it an outflow of 83? I think I'm right. Uh, finally, uh, and again, it should be a desperately easy mark. Once we've got the cash flows, uh, we need to account for the time value of money at the cost of capital. Here we told the cost of capital is 10%. Uh, again, last time I went through explaining why we discount, didn't I, Alison? Uh, in the middle of the exam, it's irrelevant. I'm afraid at this stage it's just got to be rules and automatic. We need to discount at 10%. You get given tables in the exam. Any discount in the exam, you'll be expecting you to use tables. I gave you a set first thing. Can you make sure you've got the right page? I'll remind you what the other page is later. But the page ended up present value changing. Uh, and I say, it, if anybody's wondering why, you'll have to speak to me separately. In the exam, it's just got to be automatic. This is the baby bit. Um, then to get the present value to account for the interest. Just multiply by the relevant factor. We're doing it at 10%. It's the 10% column. 
And so the discount factors for one year, 0 0.909, two years, 0 0.826, 0 0.751, 0 0.683. The present values multiply by the discount factor for the net present value add up. So can we have a race, please? Multiply discount and get the NPV. Is anybody checking me? We're almost there, I'll shut up shortly and then. But the net present value is plus 387. Uh, tell me as a result, would you accept this project or reject it? Again, there'll be a mark. You're an idiot if you don't get this mark. Because whether you'd got the right figure or the wrong figure, there's a mark for the right conclusion on your figure. If it's positive, there's a net cash surplus you'd accept. If it's negative, a deficit you would reject. Uh, this project you will accept. All right.